to gonna be live in any minute now. Oh, we are live already. Yeah. We are live. A warm welcome to everyone that is joining us this evening as we continue with the week of Sobuk. We're focusing on the life of Prof. Robert Sobukwe and the uh, life of Umama Sobukwe. And so we encourage you to join us for the next couple of days. Yesterday, it was an exciting program. And so today we are continuing with the biography of Prof. Sobukwe, and we will continue further on Saturday, which is tomorrow, with a spirituality, looking at the spirituality um, aspect of it, and then on Sunday, the life of Umama Sobukwe. And so just for those who are joining and maybe hearing the name for the first time, as it will be expanded further on um, later on, um, you know, Prof. Sobukwe was a Methodist, as many of us would know, and so it is an order that we actually celebrate um, his life, even as young people who are within the Methodist Church, and those who are not Methodist have a keen interest, because we are Black people and we all share in the convictions, and there are a lot of learnings for all of us who are gathered here today. And so our encouragement is that you do give us your questions, give us your thoughts and your reflections, as the two guests that we have today we will, we will be reflecting on the life and so we would love to hear what you also have to say if you would comment on the youtube comment section and also on the facebook comment section we are keen on hearing your contribution and thoughts and so without wasting any time we are joined here by two guests who will introduce themselves and we will take it from then on so if i could ask you two gentlemen to please introduce yourself and then um, and then uh, from there on and from there on in the conversation thank you Oh, uh, is is related to uh, to the audience and the comrades watching uh, from uh, from the comfort of their homes. Um, as comrades will know, I'm Katani Mazibandila, a member of the PAC and um, an activist. So, <coughs> of, um, I've I really I really cut my teeth with um, peace must fall struggles, and um, today. Um, I mean, uh, it's always Monday. Like it, to, to, to this from now, it will be his birthday, and um, I think uh, that we we reflect on the legacy of a man who helped shape uh, uh, the politics of our country in a very tumultuous and difficult time, and um, helped uh, the trajectory of the struggle to be where it is today, and the betrayals and the reversals that have happened. But um, that's so I think that we have to will be putting out today the man himself, the legacy, and his politics is late. Right. Thank you very much, uh, and also thanks for having us here at Wesley Guild. Um, my name is Lunga Kolisa Mandashe. I'm the deputy president of the Pan Africanist Congress of Zania, uh, the organization which Robert Mangalese Sobuke is the founding president of. I'm excited to be in this conversation to talk about the man, the life, and the politics. Uh, thank you very much, Rev. Thank you. And so perhaps without wasting any time, let us hand over to you, Petani, and you can lead us in the next couple of minutes. If there are engagement after your contribution, we will um, engage those. And um, if they have been resolved later, we will continue and ask Longa to take over from there. Over to you. Thank you. Um, uh, Isabel, thanks, uh, thanks, Chair, for handing over um, uh, the remi. I will, I will start. I will start uh, by trying to to. Uh, to speak about Sobukwe in the line of uh, the many heroes of, of, of our struggle and the many people who have sacrificed their lives um, for our liberation. Mostly, uh, when, I, when, uh, when I like to speak about Sobukwe in the PEC, I like to speak about uh, the, the moment between 1906 where in Kosimbabata led uh, Zulu brave warriors to fight against uh, the Texans from the Brits in Natal, and also uh, 1960 March when we went to Sharpeville, and how these two events uh, continue to shape uh, our struggle and, and, and fight the uh, As we all know, um, that um, Sobukwe was born. Um, in, 
in, in, in Kraplanet in, on the 5th of December, um, 1921. Um, but as uh, as, a, as a young man uh, uh, growing up in um, uh, in the villages of of, of, um, of Eastern Cape, uh, it was someone who was interested uh, uh, in the politics and also uh, in the lives of, uh, of black people and their struggles and their tragedies. And uh, we know uh, for a, uh, for a fact that uh, he was uh, he, he went to uh, to Fort Hare University um, and the university that produced a lot of uh, great intellectuals of that time, and he comes from that uh, uh, from that lineage. But also, it is quite also important to speak about the man, only just uh, the biographical content of his contribution, because um, uh, mostly uh, we study our historical key historical figures only just as um, as uh, biographical, uh, all, only their biographies, but also not linking their political uh, legacy uh, with, their, with their contribution on the question of land repossession, uh, the question of, of, of uh, liberation of the African people. And uh, we know that, that uh, Prof was um, someone who said that um, uh, coming from um, uh, a middle class uh, position as a lecturer in the University of the Bit for the Zion at the time, and he devoted himself to the struggle of the African people where he found, uh, we found that he uh, resigned um, um, from the um, from the university uh, to lead uh, the African people um, um, uh, to liberation. And why do I like speaking mostly about uh, 1906 uh, and 1960? Um, because uh, pretty much it's clear that in between 1906 and 1960. Or let me say, 1959, when the PAC was formed, actually, um, there was a kind of lull in terms of direct confrontation uh, with settler colonialism, and uh, we know that some of it came from the generation of uh, of the youth leaguers who saw that leadership of the ANC at the time uh, was play acting in the struggle, and that's why him and his peers uh, and his peers are uh, in, in the form of uh, Godfrey Pigi. Uh, they formulated and then they wrote uh, the basic documents of 1949, which were adopted in the Blue Fountain Congress of the, of the ANC in 1949, which shaped uh, and became the trajectory of how the struggle of the Assamian people is supposed to be. And it was clear uh, from the 1949 program of action that uh, the African people were saying that they were going to have a go at the struggle by themselves. Um, and this was an important moment or it, it turned around the politics of our uh, of our country or the p uh, or the ANC at the time because the peace was not formed as yet Africanists did, uh, clearly had a definition of how the struggle is supposed to be formulated how the struggle is supposed to be projected and who's supposed to be in the front line of uh, of the struggle and with the adoption of the 1949 program of action from the radical uh, militant uh, young people of uh, of the ANC at the time, uh, it was very important that uh, the struggle had to not uh, had to stop being uh, play acting and instead of just making radical statements without actually uh, without actual actions. And, and you know that's how we first uh, saw 1952 um, uh, defiance campaign, um, the 1956 women's march in um, uh, to, union, to union buildings, and the many. Uh, the many struggles that uh, the Africanists spoke about, and uh, you will know uh, the Everton uh, bus, uh, bus boycott led by um, uh, uh, um, Asbeko, and also uh, the Alexandra bus boycott, which were led by uh, uh, the late uh, um, Mazunia. These were militant actions which were being uh, done or formulated around uh, by, by, by the Africanists. In in uh, in different places uh, in the country, so it kind of uh, uh, was important for me that uh, when when we did, when we speak up in 1960, uh, the leading up to to 1960 uh, are the events of, of uh, the Africanists picking up the cudgels of the struggle from uh, the warrior king, the many wars of dispossession, Ohinza, Makato. 
Shreya, Shreya. And many kings that have fought against the disposition of the African people. And coming after 1906, we were all of us collectively defeated. And what really was, what was the ANC doing at the time was the question of playing and making revolutionary and radical slogans without really following up to it. And this is where the Africans come in, uh, led by Sobu uh, being Libalo and the people of his, uh, of, of his generation, that our comrades, uh, we have been speaking a lot about struggle and what needs to be done. And the Africans within the, within the, uh, the ANC uh, bravely fought against um, the adoption of the, of the Freedom Charter, which uh, Deception spoke about we, the people of South Africa, recognize that uh, South Africa belongs to all the living black and white. And that's where the Africans rise and uh, question that how can our land belong to the dispossessor and the dispossessed? Can they be violated? the slave? It is social relation that existed in our country. Uh, it was important for the Africans, actually very disingenuous to them, that uh, you are saying that um, um, uh, we are saying that okay, our land uh, belongs to all who live in it, uh, black and white. And for the Afghanists, it did not it did not make sense because the primary uh, contradiction of the struggle of the Azanian people was the land which was dispossessed. And how then do you turn around after almost the hundred years of land uh, of wars of dispossession? They say that our land belongs to all who live, who live in it, black and white. And this is the, this is the principle that drove the Africanists uh, towards the 1958 Congress, uh, the ANC Congress in, in Transvaal in 1958, in which the Africanists were chucked out of that Congress because uh, they were clear and un uncompromising that the freedom that cannot be adopted as a policy of the, of the ANC and a policy which was undoing the gains which were gained in 1949. By the uh, program of action, and the events of the national, uh, uh, the nation building program of action of 1999 was that uh, it reconfigured the struggle to its original inception, to its original motive that the African people are fighting against the expansion of uh, European capital into our country, which took form in the wars of dispossession, and by that uh, by by that declaration from the of, 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 from the from the Chagaris camp uh, within the ANC at the time that uh, the land of all who live in it that became the cardinal sin against um, um, uh, the struggle of the African people and which so Wupe <clears throat> famously described the Freedom Charter as a colossal a colossal fraud that had ever been perpetrated amongst the African people and Mutubing also is uh, quoted saying that. Um, the Freedom Charter was an infamous document of unknown origin, which was imposed uh, in the Congress. Uh, so the formation of the PAC really follows to the struggles of the, uh, of the African people that uh, we had fought in many colonial wars uh, for many years. So our struggle for liberation was and will always be a struggle about the fact that the land of the African people was dispossessed. And that land must be restored back to the African people. And that's when uh, we broke out uh, of, uh, of the ANC. And actually, when, we, when the Africans speak about it, they say that it's the uh, ANC that left uh, the problem of the, the, uh, the real problem of Asian of land, of land of land. Then Africans just picked up, um, uh, they picked up <clears throat> the document of uh, 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 at the in 1949 uh, in Blue Mountain that really spoke about the reality of of what the struggle of the African people is supposed to be. So in, in that instance, uh, we, had, we in 1959, we had already defined, actually, right years ahead of what the ANC has become. It has become, it had, it had fallen off um, the ranks of liberation, of uh, the ranks of a liberation movement. Uh, that's what Sobuko said, that uh, the ANC has been caught in a cartilage and a quagmire where they are found to have been placing the oppressor and the oppressed, which is not possible. Uh, you cannot be uh, for the oppressor and the oppressor at the same time. And they were found placing these two camps in the sense that how can you, in 1955, 
declare that the land of the African people belongs to all who live in it, black and white. When clearly, when Jan when, when Jan van der Beek landed with these three ships uh, in the Cape of Good Hope, uh, he did not land here with um, with any piece of land with him. And how and at what uh, at what what given rights uh, did um, 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 the you colonize the British and the Dutch themselves have or even naming our, our country and bordering it and it's a, call it it's South Africa and the Azanian school of thought point of departure departs from a point that the 19 unionization of of, of, of of South Africa it comes from an illegal and an illegitimate point of view because uh, the so-called South African war between the Brits and the Dutch fighting over the land which is which is not even theirs where do even they even get the guards to even fight over the land not theirs in in the first place and call it the South African war and South Africa is a country born out of a marriage between the Boris and the and, and, and the British even consulting the natives of who were, who were later brought in uh, into the states in 1994 and all this time they had been excluded and in an analogy uh, pro uh, provided by the chairperson of the PSC in, in, in Houting, uh, he left to bring an analogy of a car that um, the, in 1994 the ANC inherited a car that was stolen from the African people and now the master, the white people are sitting at the back seat directing the direction at which the car is supposed to go and this car, uh, when the white man says it must, it must go left, it goes left. When it goes, it goes right, it must go right. But the most confusing part becomes when they say that it must turn straight. And this is what uh, had become uh, the ANC in post-1994 South Africa. And the hammering of colonial thefts and displaced African people in Section 25 of, of the Constitution, the so-called wealth-based Constitution, which speaks about uh, protection of, of private property. And in 1994, who was supposed to be protected? And we know that uh, the African people had been dispossessed of their land. And you cannot come into 1994 and speak about protection, uh, the protection of, of, of property when the land of the African people had been systematically been uh, dispossessed by the, um, um, uh, uh, by, uh, by the settlers. So post-1994 politics of what Robert Mangalisa Sobukwe stood for is that uh, he foresaw uh, the betrayal and um, and the selling of the African people by the Gombrero bourgeoisie in the form of the African National Congress, whom today are dead uh, with, them, uh, uh, with the enemy, uh, which is the African people. And they themselves have also been embedded in, the, in this politics. Uh, they've also become part and parcel of the selling out of the African people and the struggle of the African people. That's why we find that in today's time, even over 80 percent of our white people and the white minority in this country uh, speak about the so-called rainbow nation and the united country whereas the primary contradiction uh, in this country which is the land has not been resolved and this is where the PAC continues to struggle and pick the, the cartels for and when we came into 1994 we spoke clearly and said that land first and the rest must follow and that has not been uh, our, uh, uh, the project that has been followed and that is not only a betrayal of the legacy of the PAC, because the PAC does not come into the struggle as the sole owners of, of, of the struggle. We don't own the struggle. We, we continue with the struggle where it started in the first land war, in, in the first uh, wars of land dispossession. And this is where we pick our uh, uh, our ideological opinion. Our struggle is the struggle to repossess the land which has been repossessed from the African people. The stood for and continues to stand for even uh, in his death. I will stop here. Thank you, thank you so much, Petani. Um, a couple of comments we have from Facebook. Linda Guame says so. Hugo practicalized what was conceived, uh, what was conceived by um, Anton Lembede and A. P. M. Da. Um, and perhaps you know, just to hear from your side, you know, um, one has always been fascinated by the. Um, clarity with which Sobukwe has maintained his relationship, the tension that would exist between having a relationship with whiteness and yet still being clear on the place of whiteness in Africa, you know, as far as land ownership, etc. 
I would be keen to hear from you, you know, um, on what are your thoughts, you know, particularly on how civil government maintained a relationship, you know, we can, um, you know, we can mention a whole lot of examples with white people, you know, the likes of Benjamin Pokrand, who would have made his stay even in prison more bearable, you know, and yet maintain this relation, these personal relationships without losing his convictions around the place of whiteness in our struggle and where we need to go. You know, in, in your view and in your understanding of his biography, how would you say one like that managed to maintain that particular relationship? Because it's a struggle that we are all faced with. We all have relationship with whiteness to a particular extent, but it often becomes difficult to maintain that relationship without corrupting our convictions around the place of whiteness in Africa. Hi, Pitani, are you still there? Or is it my network? I was Okay, I think... Oh, okay, sure. Please go for it. My mic... Uh, to simply... Uh, in time, so... We have spoken... A very, very in Herald in the 1970s, where he spoke about uh, or the role of white people uh, in the struggle. And it is clear uh, from the basic documents of PhD uh, what uh, the mission of white people in, in, in Africa, in South Africa, uh, are for them to be really fully citizens of Africa. Uh, there are three conditions that are, are not negotiable at all and must be met. First being that the land must be returned to the African people. And secondly, uh, the rule of the African majority who are the, um, the native must be, must be uh, respected. Uh, uh, thirdly, uh, when an Africanist socialist, uh, Africanist socialist democracy is established, in uh, in Asania, they are to pledge their alliance to that, and, and from then uh, that will be when they stop that plus. But any point and at any time, until the land of the African people is to the rightful owner, is still uh, remain our uh, people uh, 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 in country. Is that the land, the hands of the white minority? This is very important because uh, truthful is that uh, we all do have a certain relations with white people, but those relations do not suspend the primary, and the basic reason on why uh, antagonism with white people. And we also very, uh, articulated this, and he said that. We do not, when we made the Shambo, that uh, we do not hate white people because they are white, but we hate them because we associate them with. And one cannot say that uh, uh, they hate the Shambo, but they do not hate the one, the one who wins the Shambo. Once the opposition of the African people is removed out of the way, uh, that is done, uh, there, will, there will not be anything to be antagonistic to towards uh, white people. There will not be any hate that the African people have against white people because we associate them with our and we are in the struggle to fight against our oppression. So therefore, until such um, um, uh, oppression is ended, until uh, the remains of the African people is restored, African uh, white people still remain um, the primary enemy uh, of, of the African people at the time. But in today's time, post-1990 and towards, towards South Africa, the white people have even incorporated some of the compatible bourgeoisie ANC uh, to be the ones who are wielding the shambok on their behalf while they sit and enjoy the riches of power. No, great, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Petani. Um, you know, uh, and maybe if you are still here, you know, before we, we move on to. Um, to Deputy Lunga, um, you know, it's, it's maybe a follow-up to that. You know, some might even argue 
that um, Sobukwe's relationship with Benji, um, Benjamin pa uh, Pogran, made his he made his stay at prison more bearable. You know, um, had it been an ordinary black man that has no relationship with whiteness, um, there, are, there is so much that that particular black man would have not had access to. You know, from material things um, to some, to even how Benji was able to manipulate certain things like Mama Sobukwe's visit, etc. You know, and so some might even argue that uh, perhaps his, his relationship with whiteness made his life easy, you know, and maybe that is why it was so easy to hold these convictions, um, you know, because he was not feeling um, the shambok of being black and being seen as black, particularly given the fact that he was a middle class black. You know, um, what would you say about that? You know, because I suppose that is what also creates divisions even within uh, amongst us, you know, as black activists. There are those who are seen as having proximity to whiteness, and therefore they do not have that sense of urgency that some might have. You know, how would you say, um, what, would, what would you say to that with regards to Sobukwe's relationship and whiteness? Or is that related to me or the DP? No, to you. I was just I was just indicating to the DP that after this we are moving over to him. Oh, oh okay, okay, no, okay, it's fine. I thought it was, it was the DP. Uh I think it's it's also uh quite important to uh to put it out there that uh mostly throughout history, uh it, the leadership of the African people mostly have has has always come from uh, black people who were, who were in, in middle class positions because uh, for me, for you to be able to access a certain level of knowledge and understanding of the history of the world, you need, to, you need to have a certain level of education, right? If you didn't have that, I mean, uh, it was very difficult to even theorize or understand where the struggle of our people comes from. And those uh, class divisions amongst, amongst our people, yes, they, they do they do really, uh, really um, play a major role in in uh, in dividing us and 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 where we are, but so who uh, like his and Africanist peers of that time, I will draw close attention to uh, to America Cabral of Guinea Bissau and also Walter Rodney of um of um of Guyana. Um, um, America Cabral was a qualified uh, engineer. Who had just completed his degree in one, one of the universities in, in Portugal, and then he came back in in, in Guinea Bissau, uh, committed a class suicide, and relinquished all the privileges that he would have had as, a, as an engineer to lead um, the African people to wage a revolutionary struggle against um, uh, our, our colonialism. And also, uh, on the other side, um, you find uh, Walter Rodney. Uh, a distinguished historian and, 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 and an academic who had worked, worked in prestigious institutions in um, worldwide in, in, in different countries, had been working in Tanzania and also working in Jamaica uh, at, at, at some point, uh, left Tanzania and said that he has a revolutionary obligation and a moral duty to go and work with his people in, uh, in Guyana. And even in the eve of his return uh, to Guyana, actually, uh, he, he had he had gotten a job in one of the universities uh, in the country, but the president had blocked it, uh, and he did not get uh, ended up not having a job. And also, his wife um, Patricia Rodney, who was the nurse at the time, she did not have employment at all. And uh, to Guyana between 1972 and, and 1980, he was unemployed, and he was working and organizing with the. Uh, um, with, with an organization uh, called uh, Reggae People's Alliance in, in, in Guyana, sacrificed everything to lead the struggle of the African people um, in, in Guyana, neocolonialism, until it was assassinated in 1980. And this is the same trajectory that Robert Mangali so Sobukwe takes. And actually, um, even before he could, he, uh, Sobukwe resigned uh, from, uh, from this university, he was offered even another prestigious post. Uh, at, at Rhodes University, and he rejected that. Go and lead the African people uh, to a uh, liberation. And uh, those relations that he had with uh, white, white, the white liberals um, in the form of uh, 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 Prop Gun, 
and uh, many other um, uh, white liberals that used to write him, uh, to him when he was still in prison, did not even at any point made him flinch about his commitment, commitment to the liberation of the African people. He, has, he was always committed as ever. And that, that for me, uh, sums up a man who was principled and morally uptight about the role that he, uh, that he has to play in the liberation of, uh, of the African people. And uh, to, for me, uh, it sums up uh, a person who was committed uh, to a revolutionary theory and revolutionary practice and practice until, until the bitter end. Even with that, that uh, uh, he was blocked uh, uh, from employment at the time when, when, uh, when uh, uh, he left um, um, uh, Arabian Island and he was also being and sick at the time. And he even wanted to leave the country and the government stopped it. So it is quite important to understand that uh, this man sacrificed everything that he had, uh, his president's job at Fes University, to lead the African people uh, towards the rule for, for, uh, for liberation. And not many people could, uh, can do that. Uh, some people use, choose to remain in, the, uh, in their preachers' middle class uh, positions and not relinquish uh, um, um, those rights. I think I think uh, it's, it would be it should be it's far fetched uh, to even want to even associate that uh, or to even try and paint that uh, so as a kind of person who had uh, it better as compared to other black people. I mean, the man was literally uh, sentenced uh, until the side of eternity for six years in Robert Island. But I don't think uh, anyone who has an honest reading of history would even even have made a, even attempt to even speak uh, a, um, a privileged prisoner in Robert Island. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Moafrika. Um, without wasting any time, we could continue with these conversations for so long. Um, let us move over to DP Olonga. And before you go on, let us also acknowledge the presence of Upatu, who will then be contributing to the conversation later um, after DP. Thank you, and over to you. Right, thank you um, again. I think what I would like to do is to speak about Sobukwe, particularly in the context of what we see today. First of all, let me confirm that I am audible on your side before I proceed. Okay, fantastic. So what I want to do is to say three things. The first is about ideology. The second is about leadership. And the last is about the politics of race. Let me deal with the first one on the question of ideology. Sobukwe, in the 1940s, when he was an SRC president at Forte, actually hit it in the nail, hit, hit it on the nail when he said that he as the leader of the SRC and they as African people at the time were not concerned with personalities. At that time, what was happening was the fact that one a principal was, was changed for another. So his point in his speech, in his speech, was that we are not concerned with with uh, personalities. We are concerned with policies those personalities pursue, and this is why when the PAC broke away from the ANC, ultimately in nineteen after nineteen fifty five, it was not because Albert Lutuli became the president and that he was actually clueless about questions of struggle, but that it was because. Um, the ANC had departed from the fundamental ideological principle of 1949. Why is this point important? This point is important for two reasons. The first reason is that people often think that if you change a leader, things are going to become better. This is why in this country, when the government changed from the white hands to black hands in 1994, people thought that things were going to change. This is exactly, secondly, why when Tabumbegi came through, they thought, okay, we have a new guy, things might change. And then when uh, Zuma came in, very popular, people said he was going to be a good guy and all things were going to be sorted. And then later, Cyril Ramaphosa, I think Cyril Ramaphosa actually, you know, um, uh, his, uh, his uh, ascendancy into power was even more exciting for many people that were saying, ah, we now have got an a good guy who's going to come in and change the problems that we and solve the problems that we have. So what it tells you is that people 
in politics think of politics in terms of persons, in terms of individuals, in terms of who is the president, in terms of who is uh, the leader of the country. They think that a country changes because a leader wants it to change. The reality, as someone could put it, was that ideology is very central. And that, and that is why at that time, for, uh, he, he saw Stellenbosch as a barometer of European thought, and he argued for Forte to be a barometer of African thought. And he was actually invoking an ideological antithesis to herfunkism or to the politics of apartheid colonialism. So the, uh, so the essence of the point I'm trying to put to you and your audience is the significance of ideology. Um, for example, if you want to test this hypothesis of Sobukwe again, you can look at the ideology of uh, the, uh, the Englishman and the African man, or the Boa in particular, uh, when they formed the Union of South Africa. So they perpetuated one single ideology. It didn't matter whether you had a fair hood or whether you had a PW border or whether you had a declared. The policy that was being pursued was an apartheid policy. So, um, so that's the first reason why ideology is important. It's important because it doesn't matter whether you have a soft-spoken man in power or you have got a man who looks innocent on TV when he announces a lockdown or when he changes his word and says we were supposed to have a lock, we were not supposed to be uh, vaccinated by force, but hey, what can we do? We now need to set up a trust team. You know, it doesn't matter whether you have an, an innocent-looking guy uh, or you have a corrupt uh, guy, as the case may be. And I'll talk about the question of leadership, but that question of leadership is secondary. And I do want to emphasize the uh, criticality of this point. The question of leadership is secondary. The first and the most fundamental question is ideology. Um, and I will explain again why this is critical and give you, um, you know, Another reason. So the, the, the governing party has been pursuing a neoliberal policy since 1994. And this neoliberal policy hasn't been able to produce jobs. It hasn't been able to produce uh, uh, jobs that are capable of helping people continue to live and survive and go to work in the next morning. And and so if you look at it from that perspective, what you were looking for was uh, merely change of face and not necessarily change of policy in, in any fundamental sense. Because what informs policy is ideology. So ideology is a system of belief about how the world should be structured, about how our politics should be structured. And therefore, if you negate ideology, which is what Mr. Mandela did in 1991 when he was talking to Ted Koppel, at the United States of America, he negated ideology. He said he didn't care whether the cat was black or white as long as he could catch mice. In other words, he didn't care about the economic ideology, the economic policy. And so we insisted on this particular question of land repossession and and, uh, and you know and, and land ownership, collect ownership. He talks about the state planned economy. He talks about this idea of most equitable distribution of resources. He didn't say, I don't care whether the cat is black or white as long as it can catch mice. So today you are sitting, for example, at an unemployment rate, roughly close to five out of 10 people are unemployed. And those that are unemployed, actually, about 6 million of them, at least according to the president of the country last year, about 6 million of them earn less than 6,000 rents. That is less than the what you would call the living wage, because a living wage should be at least above 6.5. And I'm not quite sure how, how much it should be now. The economists are going to tell us because we know that the petrol prices are going up skyrocketingly. They even couldn't count the, the cents correctly, you know, the department. Uh, they were just kind of changing, um, they're changing the stats. So, so the reality is that uh, the neoliberal policies that are underpinned by the imperialist colonial neoliberal agenda are not working. They are not solving the problem. This is why the, the this is why ideology is so central. And this is precisely why the, the Sobukwe and company left the ANC. The ANC had departed from an ideological point. And and they they, they didn't 
leave because they didn't like Mandela or they didn't like, uh, like I was saying, what is a Sulu or they didn't like so-and-so or didn't like Oliver Tambo. It was not because they, they had hatred for a man. So having explained the question of ideology, um, I think it's, it's critical to, um, to emphasize why this ideology on the question of land was so central to Sobukwe. And I mean, as, as Petani was saying, I mean, if you look at the 2017 report, uh, there's a high level panel report by Khalima Mutrande, who himself is a former president. Uh, you know, it tells us that it would take us about 703 years to get the land back to the restitution policy. What does that tell you? It tells you that the restitution policy can never return your land back. But secondly, what does it? And, and then, and then the debate about expropriation without compensation began in nineteen in in two thousand um, roughly two thousand sixteen seventeen, and there was a hope around that there was actually something that was going to happen, and there's nothing that's going to happen because the framework of the South African Constitution is a multiracial constitution which Sobukwe actually dealt with. And I'm now jumping the leadership question to the racial question, the race question. Uh, so the constitution is a multiracial, is a multiracialist constitution. And this is precisely why your so-called land expropriation without compensation would never, I can, I can bet you my life, the expropriation of land without compensation is never going to work. And I'm not being a pessimist, I'm being ideological about it. And I'm trying to explain this from the ideological perspective that it's a waste of time. It is used to create an impression by politicians to make people believe that something is happening or will happen. As long as you don't change the restitution policy, as long as you don't change the redistribution policy of the African National Congress, as long as you don't change the multiracialist constitution, white people are guaranteed of the property rights that they have because the constitution guarantees that. And that was precisely Sobukwe's contention. The contention was that multiracialism is a method of the Europeans to protect their property, their stolen property. So it was always, so the Freedom Charter of 1955 was always designed fundamentally to preserve or to protect white interests, to protect herefunkism in a new, what Sobuka called a democratic apartheid, which is where we are right now. So we're in a democratic apartheid now. I think another fellow wrote that uh, apartheid was not, uh, apartheid did not end, it became privatized. Well, apartheid still remains multiracialized because that was a party that was the, so apartheid was itself a method of safeguarding uh, white interests. And someone made a very interesting point. He said, white people, there were some white people who were intellectually converted and who felt strongly that this was wrong. You know, this colonial apartheid was wrong. But because of their material position, they could not, um, you know, remove themselves from the benefits that they were kind of getting. And this is why, you know, APLA was engaged in, um, in a struggle where we, you know, we even bombed churches because there was no good white person, precisely speaking. Everybody was part and parcel of an apartheid set up, either by complicity or by ignorance but certainly by material benefits. And so this was another ideological point that we were drew. And in his conception of the method of struggle, he then said we shouldn't involve white people in our struggles, precisely because it makes us look incapable of handling our own affairs as African people. And then he said leaders must be on the front and these must be African leaders on the front. If white people want to sympathize with us, that's okay. They must form their own leadership and their own structures, and they must oppose colonialism and apartheid. If Indians want to do the like, they must oppose colonialism and do the like. So, so in other words, you can also not only see the ideology, you can see the tactics and strategies of struggle that Sambukwe actually employed, because he fully understood what happened when, and this is what communists, you know, the quack communists of South Africa did 
after the defiance campaign. They went in and saved some of the comrades who got arrested and they destroyed the program of 1949. And Zawoko was saying, this is the challenge. If a white man is going to come and save you whenever you are in trouble, then you can't be truly free from you know, the trappings of whiteness. You see, you can't stand alone as African people. And so that was also his contribution. So his contribution was on this notion of non-racialism as opposed to multi-racialism. So Buka also made a contribution, and I'm getting to the question of leadership uh, because I can't deal with all the stuff in detail at once. So Buka dealt with the question of leadership. So people say currently that when people are asked often, what is the biggest problem in South Africa? Well, they would say, well, the problem is the problem of leadership. You know, governance is dysfunctional. You know, people are corrupt. And if you can just get a good leader, <laughs> you know, and then maybe the problems would go away. Again, that's a mistaken belief because it has no ideological underpinning. What Sobuko was offering to us as a theoretician, as a philosopher, as an ideologue, and as a man of praxis, was that leadership must be underpinned by ideology. That's why when they supported one candidate to become the president, you see, of the ANC in the, in the late 40s, they said they, 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 didn't, they were not necessarily looking for an ideologue. They were looking for a man who could be tied to a program of action, who could be tied ideologically to a program of action. Because what was more important was that somebody who is a leader must follow a program of action that flows from the policy of the organization and that also flows from the ideology of the organization. So questions of leadership, just like in the ANC, for example, the people that are in government in the ANC are following an ANC policy. And that's why this is a policy that has produced five out of 10 unemployed people. This is a policy that has produced uh, over 6 million people who earn less than 6,000 rents. This is a, this, these are people who can't even have their policies implemented because they are ideologically trapped by imperialism, colonialism, and racism. In other words, even at a point where they say they want um, the minimum wage to be 3.5, which is half of what it should be, actually, in terms of the living wage, even when they set up that policy, they themselves can't live up with that policy if you look at the expanded public works programs that they employ people on. Those people don't earn 3.5. Why are they unable to do all these things? Because solely in their good hearts, they want to do this thing. Right? The reason is ideological. The structure which structures the things that they can do does not allow them to do the things that their good hearts have, assuming that the ANC had a good heart at all, by the way. And so, so that's what you are looking at. So if you don't begin from an ideological premise, and if you just jump into the leadership challenge, and you are not addressing the that the structural constraints are not that markets are not able to function freely because markets in the United States function freely, right? But you still have an unemployment problem in the United States, right? Even though it's probably the best democracy in the world in terms of free market capitalism, right? So the point is that ideology is so central that you could not reasonably have a debate about unemployment, hunger, and poverty, and inequality, and landlessness without talking about ideology. Let me pause there in, in the interest of time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, um, Longa. Um, I just want to acknowledge one, two, a uh, few comments um, from Linda Kwame from Facebook. The first is that just like Lembede, he rejected white tutelage. He was at the same time aware to the reality that we are all human, hence he conceptualized the concept of non-racialism. He was clear, though, that only in a new Africa, where an Africa has achieved its liberation, that non-racialism would be realized. And the second, Absolutely. from the same um, from the same person, um, Linda, um, it says, ideology is both the vision and anchor without which you are raiderless and, and, and destined for collapse as the case now things are falling apart as the center cannot hold and so um vice um, um deputy I'm, I'm 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 going to be um a bit silly here you know because we we are speaking to um people who may identify with the ideology and people who do not you know and so we need to cater 
different um, forms of thinking. Yeah. You know, um, as you have rightly mentioned, uh, the fellow you, you, you referred also to uh, some of the utterances that are made by Cizwe uh, Mpofu, um, just around um, the new apartheid, as he calls it. Um, but I want to pick up on that and ask then, based on Sobuko's conviction, would we say strategy without ideology is not progressive? You know, for many people, they would say some of the decisions made by the ANC uh, during the, uh, the conversations that um, realized what we now see uh, view as a democracy, uh, some would say it was strategic conversations, you know, as Mbeki once um, claimed at a OR Tambo lecture um, that was held at yeah. Kote, where he said um, every generation has its mandate. And um, that particular generation's mandate was um, a political freedom. And therefore, every generation needs to pick up. So it was a, the argument was that it's a strategy and not necessarily just selling out completely. However, yeah. however um, you know, when we come to the issue of strategy, we have seen, for instance, in the recent um, um, unrest, as some might call it, or the uh, grievances that found a um, opportunity to express themselves through what was happening at that particular moment. Um, one of the things that emerged strongly was the issue of privatized security. Now, I, 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 um, I live close to a suburb, a, which is called an agricultural holding. And anyone who's been in an agricultural holding would know that that's where white wealth is. Um, yeah. Now, they have employed all systems of privatized security, which unfortunately does not guarantee liberation for the majority of black people. It instead criminalizes and endangers black people. It makes black people seem like criminals that have to check in through various boom gates and have to use routes that protect the people who are living in that particular uh, suburb uh, from the white majority that comes into that particular place for work um, in the everyday migration from townships to suburbs. Um, it, and it doesn't answer the issue of land. However, the issue here is that there are black people in those suburbs who benefit from these securities. And you would find that some of them are part and parcel of the community forums that would insist on these systems of privatized um, security that then criminalizes black people and allows white people to go in and out of township as they please, but not the majority of black people in suburbs. Now, when it comes to this particular black people, for them, this is, it offers a good life. It offers a life that is free from crime. It offers a life that is free from um, being threatened by looters, as uh, yeah. some would want to put it, you know? Mm -hmm. And therefore it problematizes again, the proximity of blackness to whiteness, that there are things that we forget, you know, when we are in proximity to whiteness, you know? Um, I would be keen to hear, you know, what are your thoughts on this, especially in light of the relationship that the PAC has had um, with whites, being very clear that whites must establish themselves and work towards liberation and support the struggle of black people, however, without taking over it. Um, however, you find that when black people are in proximity to whiteness, we tend to lose these things. These things go out the window and what's important is personal security. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would refer your, your audience to the work of um, Amelka Cabral when he talks about what happens post, what he calls post-independence, uh, what happens to what Fanon calls the national bourgeoisie, which is basically the black leaders, what the black leaders do um, post, um, you know, you know, colonialism, even though they, that, pro that concept is problematic. But uh, you know the ex the example of that is what happened here in in, in South Africa. That what happened is that there was a co-option of black leaders into the white world to perpetuate white supremacy, to perpetuate and to democratize apartheid, and to uh, fulfill the imaginations of the father of Nikki Oppenheimer in the forties who said what they needed to do was to integrate, to send black, some black uh, people to school and then integrate them into. I mean, people like Mbegi, I'm sorry to say, these are people who, who pursued some of their studies in the West 
And so they were, they were always going to be influenced intellectually through what could be called soft power in the classroom by the most influential neoliberal economists. And, and, and so uh, you, you could see the, the influence of the West, even in our conceptions of the legal system with regards to the question of property, for example. So in the so in, in 1994, so 90, so the negotiation of 1990s um, was not, it seems to me, a strategy that involved the dispossessed masses of our people. It was a strategy of the black leaders to enter into the democratic apartheid parliament and establish themselves through the affirmative action programs like the BEE and the triple BEE. And, and if you look at their land policy of prior 1994, for example, it was that they were going to return 30% of the land. So they sold a dummy to the masses in the form of the vote. And then they never returned that land. They simply tried to change the policy a little bit after 1999. And they changed it again in 2002, then in 2006, then in 2011, then now in 2017. So they keep on, you know, doing this kind of thing. So what's the point here? The point here was that the strategy had nothing to do with you and me. It had nothing to do with the masses. The um, wh why am I saying that? I'm saying that for two, for one reason, and and that reason was that the apartheid government was so unpopular in the late 80s and the early 90s that we were supposed to press it even harder on the table. And what the ANC did not do was to press harder and make several key demands, demands of which would have had to include the land question. The ANC would have learned that Zimbabwe, just in the next door, had struggled since 1979 to get its land. And it was now 1991 in Odessa negotiations, and Zimbabweans had not yet gotten their land. So what kind of strategy that has no historical sense could get the ANC to agree to not even get a piece of it. In fact, in 1987, uh, 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 there was a paper written by the World Bank, and this paper talked about neoliberal policies, you know, and, and why people were still busy taking land in 1991 in Orania, not so far away, in the Free State. And so you could see that the ANC didn't press up. So it was not a strategy. If it was a strategy, it was a strategy for some, and not a strategy that involved everybody. But the last point to make around, because I think it's an important point, because this point is made quite often that we had no choice. So basically what that means logically is that white people had a choice, but we had no choice. And, and precisely because they were able to sell big industries like ISCO at that point in time, sure. right? They were able to sell ISCO, to privatize ISCO. What were they doing? why people had a clear political exit strategy. Their exit strategy was to privatize what they nationalized for over 70 years, right? That's what they did. Because all these companies, including the ESCOM that they want now to be privatized, was formed and was a nationalized um, asset. And at that time, white people had about 57% of the economy under the hands of the government. Now, how many state-owned enterprises belong to the ANC government? And how many state-owned enterprises are a, are a ticking time bomb? And how many have already exploded? So what it tells you is that you can't run a state depending on foreign aid. You can't run a state depending on foreign investment run along the terms of the foreigner. And so we have not dealt with that question. So let me deal with the last point that you've raised. With you. The point about um, the black middle class that lives in suburbs and how their relation seems to make them to, um, you know, to, to forget about the, the struggle. Look, this is a difficulty of class struggle within a colonial context, right? Because these are people that materially are better off than the most dispossessed and dejected of the people living in Kailicha, living in Tanzania, Gombo, and so on. These are the most, these are the less dejected. So these are uh, what Fanon would call people who cannot be truly white because the white men will not accept them, but they can neither be truly black 
because they've sure. already left the black well. So they are experiencing cognitive dissonance of, the, of some sort. And so you can see um, that they, because of their own class position within a post-colonial democratic apartheid, because of that, uh, the, a man looks out for himself first, particularly if he has no principle. Sobuka could have done the same thing actually when he was a lecturer at Wits. He could have looked out for himself. But what did he choose? He chose to commit class suicide, just like people like Che Guevara did, just like people uh, like Rutni chose to do, and so on and so on. So, so these are people, and it's unfortunate, just maybe as a parting point, it's unfortunate that in all histories, most of the struggles have always been led by this middle class, precisely because of its levels of education and its levels of proximity to that power. And perhaps precisely because they salivate to occupy that power for themselves, as opposed to salivating, as opposed to, um, you know, um, overthrowing that power. Because the ultimate point must be to abolish all forms of apartheid, colonial, imperial, imperialist, racist power and establish the power of the African people. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, and maybe that, let's, there's, there's a couple of comments from Facebook. Um, have not seen any questions as yet. Um, but the first one, again, from Linda Kwame, our struggle and the very creation of liberation movements centered around the restoration of our stolen land. Anything that is offered outside this is useless and tantamount to betrayal of the African people. A second comment, again, 1990s declared choreographed negotiations were aimed to sanitize apartheid its beneficiaries and guaranteed a, the criminal Western world and its financial institution payments of odious debts given to the criminal regime to, mime and butcher, to maim and butcher the African people. And perhaps as we continue even on that, um, there are those who then argue around politics of identity, and I will pose this perhaps to both you, um, Lunga and Petani, there are those who argue around politics of identity that Black people, African people, like any other continent, I am not a stagnant species. You know, they also evolve. You know, they are part of the evolution process. And perhaps tomorrow, as we continue to evolve, what uh, the question of who is African and who is not, the question of who the land belongs to and who it doesn't belong to, will not be a question that is, uh, that is answered along racial lines. But we will find, need to find a new definition of what it means to be African that is not necessarily synonymous to race. And therefore they argue that like any other continent in the world, um, uh, so it, it, it is, uh, or rather they first argue that it is kind of condescending to suggest that black people are still stuck on defining themselves, or rather Africans are still stuck on defining themselves based on race. They too, like anyone else, will evolve. And therefore we need to reconsider arguments around yeah. um, black uh, ownership of land. And, and, and then perhaps consider new forms of ownership. Any thoughts on that? Because those are prevailing school of thoughts at the moment. No, I mean, I just want to jump in. Look, th these are some of the Western epistemic sense, epistemic lenses, the ways of knowing borrowed from the West. Um, if you look at philosophers like John Locke, for example, and Stuart Mill, and uh, these are philosophers who basically philosophize the questions of individualism and property ownership and so on. And basically, precisely because Europeans pretty much had no land than, pretty much, I'm not saying all the land, had no land than that which they had stolen elsewhere, you know. And so they had to conceptualize a new philosophy uh, of talking about, um, you know, how do we justify our colonialism. How do we justify taking the land of the Red Indians in the United States, for example, right? How do we justify taking the land of the Black people in Australia, for example? So we have got to begin to talk about concepts of fluidity of culture and identity, and therefore changes taking place that society is constantly evolving. Let me ask a question. Why is the idea of property, of individual property ownership not itself evolving? Why is it staying the same for over 500 years now, right? It stays the same because it is a fundamental, it is a fundamental and a bedrock of capitalism, of European imperialism, right? And that's what they try to promote here. 
when in 1994 we were going to an election, they had already written a script for us, right? That we are going to have to make property rights. We are going to give them to an individual. Why do you sell land? I always ask this question. Let me ask you a question. If you sell a piece of land, and then that was the only piece of land you had, where are you going to get it tomorrow? If you go to a bank and use your land as security, what does the bank has to have to give you? A piece of paper. What happens when you can't pay the bank back? It takes a piece of an asset. Is, is, is a piece of paper an asset? Yes, if you can convert it into that. But if you keep selling land, if you keep making land a commodity, then that's a problem. Historically, Africa land in Africa was a common property, right? Does it mean that you could not engage in market activities within this common property? No. What does it mean in terms of evolution and changes in identity and culture? It doesn't mean that you must forego the fundamental key principles that define who you are, that define how you relate to each other, the idea of community, Ubuntu, unity, sharing, and all those kinds of ideas. It doesn't mean that, quite frankly, what imperialism and capitalism has done was, that was to move the world away from the community to an individual. And look at where we find ourselves. Half of the world population lives in poverty, but only 1% of the globe owns the means of production. This cannot be. This is the culture they want to perpetuate and they want to teach us this kind of politics. So they say, get away from identity politics, but who is, is it not them who perpetuate serious identity politics by constantly categorizing people according to their own race, according to their own tribe? You can go to the United States, you are called an African-American, you are not an American. You can be a Latino, you are called a Latino-American. You are constantly categorized in identity political terms. So, so where does it where, where does this notion fit in that we shouldn't uh, be too rigid and and be trapped? Because the assumption is that you get trapped when you speak in identity cultural terms. Because there's a cultural hegemony, right? And that's imperialism. Because imperialism is about imposing a particular culture within a certain particular mode of production. Capitalism is that mode of production. Imperialism is an imposition of culture. Of the dominant. And so if we say we must move away from culture, culture cannot be changed by concepts. It is changed by power, by control of means of production, and land is that central means of production. When you control land, you not only control where the culture changes, you control the pace at which that culture changes and whether it changes or not. Thank you so much, Deputy. Um, any thoughts from your side, um, Mwafrik? I will chair, your volume is just uh, reduced from my side. Can you just at least raise your voice and give me a summary of the question so that I can respond? Oh, sure, sure. Um, I, am, I, am I audible now? Yeah, yeah, I engage you. Sure. No, so I was saying um, that you know, we have schools of thought that suggest that identity should be more fluid as it is in any other region of the world. And thus, um, they go on to argue uh, some that um, the, uh, the very notion that Africans will continue to define themselves based on race and will continue to assign ownership of land based on race is uh, condescending to Africans themselves because it then suggests that like, unlike anyone else, they are not evolving, but they have been stagnant for the past um, last 500 years. Are there any thoughts on that, on that in light of Sorubwe's um, convictions around race? Uh, yeah, I think it's, it's quite important to, to as obsessed, dismiss this not notion from the uh, many bourgeoisie scholars and, act and uh, so-called activists who want to normally say we must distance ourselves from identity politics. Uh, the first question that we must ask is that who's being racialized, who's being categorized, and to what end does that categorization and racialization benefit whom? You know? So when we speak about blackness, when we speak about being black, it is a political positionality that has been imposed to us, not only us, in the world, by uh, European conquerors and colonizers, you know? And in fact, even before they even left Europe, 
they even did it amongst their own in um, in, uh, in Ireland. Uh, the British literally um, colonized Ireland and they categorized the Irish as subhuman beings, you know? And the creation of this uh, culture, or, or no, the, the creation of this uh, identity politics serves the interest of uh, the European imperialists and, and colonizers. So if you are categorized as being black, if you are categorized as being um, a Negro, or you're, colonized, you're, you're categorized as, as whatever category uh, uh, they want to put you in, it benefits because uh, the, the reality is that uh, the relation that has been in existence is either you are white, and when you are white, uh, you are in a political positionality where you are able to benefit from the othering of others. And that othering did not only happen with Africans. It happened in North America, in the South, South America, it happened in, in Asia, and many other parts of the world where people were colonized and othered. And the creation of the identity, especially of the African people, around uh, when we became Negroes. I mean, we were abducted into uh, enslavement. And um, when we literally left the continent as Africans, and we mysteriously uh, reappeared in the Americas and and any other parts of the world as Negroes, you know. And how do you then uh, go from Africa as an African, and then when you get to the other parts of, of the world now, you are being a Negro, and that is a creation of an identity of people that uh, do not exist. People who do not have a homeland, people who would not have a way they come. That's to uproot you from at the place where you come from, where you originally originate from, which is Africa. So if uh, they are able to add that, even people amongst themselves, uh, you have to be able to understand that uh, the system uh, changes with time. It changes with time. You, you might have been, um, for example, 100 years ago, added as a, a subhuman being. But in today's time, you might your political personality might have changed. And we need to understand the reality that uh, the question of race rather than it being a natural or a biological ontology. It is not a, a biological or natural ontology. Rather, it's a socio-political uh, creation of that ontological reality of the existence of race, or that you are black, you are white, you are Indian, and whatever. So, to some of these liberals, they will want to tell you that Oh no, let's shy away from identity politics. But when identity politics have not been actually been defeated, and when we have when we come to a point where we destroy uh, the relations or the existence of the people on the other side of, of, of humanity, that of being black, and that othering of uh, of, uh, of the African people, and until such a point where we are able to have defeated uh, that adding or uh, that racialization or categorization, there will, there's always going to be a, a conflict amongst people. And that conflict, at the end of the day, is in, uh, informed by the fact that the European settlers have dispossessed the African people of their land and used uh, racist, bogus arguments to even uh, justify why they're taking, their, they're taking our land and categorizing us as subhuman. And you need to understand that uh, racism as in itself is a modality in which uh, classes live, that you are classed in, in, in different manners. And racism is one of the ways. I mean, they could also use, uh, when they stop uh, race, you'll find them using the question of, you know, but no, no, you're not, uh, you're not Tutsi, you're not Hutu, what happened in, in, uh, in Rwanda, you know? Uh, so it, Keeps mutating and changing and finding new ways in which you can you can be categorized, you can be uh you, you can be categorized and then classed in, in a different manner. And when you fall under into the underclass, therefore it is justifiable for to be uh, um, to be oppressed or to be treated as a subhuman um, um, um uh, category. And it is also quite important to look uh in uh, to look into history. 
honestly and from an, um, an honest uh, point of view. But also what Sobuge does in resolving this, this, uh, this question of, of, of race, he speaks about the fact that uh, uh, the, at the end goal of, of, of the struggle of the African people is that we are all uh, going back to be uh, categorized as humans and to give the question of, of, our, 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 of race, right? But uh, that cannot be said that in continent of South Africa we have reached that utopia where we are all equal and uh, there is no rationality in terms of that I'm black and being black carries a historical connotation of that of dispossession of, of our land. And we, can, we, can, we cannot say that 1994 has uh, we arrived in a, in, in a utopia where everyone is starting at, 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 an, at, an, at an equal pace. That it means it will be important to look and continue to speak about this categorization and racialization of the native African people, not just only in the continent, but even in other continents, even North America and in South America. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And so as we draw uh, towards our end, uh, just a couple of comments, as you may see on the screen, um, it is only when it comes to Africa where our land is expected to belong to everyone. China belongs to Chinese, India belongs to Indians, Europe belongs to Europeans. We must never allow anyone to dictate to us how to relate with our land. Absolutely, particularly the latter sentence um, that we must never allow anyone to determine how we relate to our land. And Umfundisu Kams are saying, Sengati Angan Fago Umtika, meaning it is as though he can just um, make you uh, Methodist uh, preachers, indeed, because. Some of these issues are sometimes even implicated in some in in in, in, uh, in, in, in stuff that happens in, in stuff that is taught on Sundays. One can only imagine the impact that the story of creation, as we understand it, interpret it, has on um, identity politics and determining who is and who is not. Um, but before we close today's session, I would like to just um, open it up to you uh, both to hear: Are there any parting words? Uh, particularly my interest uh, from my side personally, you know, is really if there are any parting words on the whole idea of saying how do we make sure that our um, convictions, our political convictions, our ideological convictions remain clean in a world where we interact with so much. If you look at global stats, we are told that Christianity is growing, is uh, Africa is the fastest growing um, a continent as far as Christianity is concerned, you know, and so we engage with so much from media to church to many stuff, you know, and I would love to hear um, because we can never take ourselves onto an island while engaging um, issues of day-to-day uh, -day importance. We need to be involved with life, you know, and I would really love to hear from your side, you know, um, just your thoughts on how you would advise young people, um, people of middle age, everywhere in every spaces as to how they can continue drawing from the bi uh, biography of both keep their convictions around um, what is at hand and the struggle that is at hand um, clean so that they're always clear regardless of the spaces they find themselves in. Uh, but any other thoughts you have in addition uh, to anything that might have stood out for you? Thank you. All right, I would like to first of all thank you for allowing us to engage in your platform as Weld Guild SA. Uh, I think we should say that uh, we are deeply honored, uh, particularly because you are a religious platform or a spiritual platform. I think it's crucial that uh, you open platforms like this because it is through these platforms, and given the fact that many of your members are members of society. And therefore, we are not just addressing people of a spiritual kind, but we are also addressing people who may also suffer from material penury, as the case may be. So we are deeply indebted to, to your organization for inviting us here. And I think that's one of the ways in which we can continue to build what we could call ideological consciousness. Look, it's no longer about building people's political consciousness right now. It's about building ideological consciousness, people understanding that politics is about ideology. Politics is not just about a, a mayor or about some coalition in some municipality and so on. 
politics is really about ideology. It's about what ideologies drive these organizations and these political parties. And, and, and these ideologies affect the way we think what we think and how much we can make out in terms of what politics really are about. So I think it's a perfect platform. And I think beyond that, what needs to happen, one of the things I often say is that politics should never be a matter that people have a choice whether they should know or not. Schools should have politics as a subject. Schools should have history as a subject. Schools should have philosophy as a subject. Schools should have polit a political ideology as a subject. And there should be debates in schools, in the classrooms about conditions of the African people. I'll tell you why these things don't happen. Because politicians can't afford reading, learning, debating, discussing, and conscious people. Because otherwise, then you would know, we would have no politicians. Tomorrow, you would have a revolution. And they, they are scared precisely of that. And so what we should take away from Prof is the centrality of ideology and the secondarity of leadership and this proper interpretation of race relations that Prof talks about. But importantly, we must never be, we must never allow ourselves to believe that we were free simply because we had a job that paid us 6,000 rands or even 20,000 rands. We cannot be free unless all of us are free and not and none of us can be free unless we get the land back. At the pace at which we are going right now as a country, we are never going to get the land. I don't care who says what. You can invite me in the next 10 years. And let's talk about, I'll still be alive then. And let's talk about uh, the land expropriation policy of this. Let's see how far it has gone. I can, I can assure you. What we need to do in this country is what we are all scared of you know, is to revolt, right? You cannot reasonably force people in power by a mere dialogue on a Facebook platform. At some point, this platform must be used to, you know, impart knowledge. But knowledge does not change things. It was Marx who said philosophers have interpreted the world thus far. The point is to change the world, not just to interpret it. So, so we are interpreting the world, but we have to get to the point of changing it. And that's true revolution by no other means. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deputy. Um, any, 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 any thoughts from your side, uh, Putani? Petani? Uh, since we are a church, I will definitely leave the um, application with so we just um, told that it was a one or uh, seven, which uh, clearly, if you read it, it articulated his politics. It said that um, with fire, um, and your fields are being devoured by uh, foreigners, and yet you sit down and do nothing about it. It encapsulates um, ideas that uh, I, I stood for as a, as a lay preacher in the Methodist Church. Uh, it's quite important that, you know, as, as young revolutionaries, when we get introduced to, uh, to revolutionary theory, we tend to kind of reject a uh, church. Like now, we, we, uh, black people don't go to church and all these things. But that is where the masses of our people are found, you know? So when when you grow and and you, and you start learning and you start seeing Marx writing that religion is the opium of the masses and you start rejecting church and all these things, but that is actually a fundamental mistake as one can make as a Marxist that ah uh, you must apply uh, the theory to to the, the conditions that you have uh, 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 in your country or in the in, in context of, of of where you are and that that is why it's important because recently I learned. Of a clip that uh, comment made about the importance religion has to play, and that what was black theology was used uh, in the seventies uh, with the uh, uh, that we must go to where our people are. When the PSC was was, was uh, mobilizing for the uh, for the first election campaign in nineteen sixty, they said that we must go to every hard to every corner of the country. We're even mobilizing uh, thugs, I mean, uh, people who were 
um, against us. We, we mobilize every section of society. So we need we need everyone. And as 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 young revolutionaries and people who you got introduced to revolutionary theory, it was very easy to just dismiss religion. But also at the same time, that is where the mass of our people are found. And we must permeate into these spaces. We must get into these spaces and use the very same Bible uh, that so we used um, to connect or to gather our people to understand them, uh, to make them understand that the question of national liberalization has not been complete. And to wrap it up to on my point of 1906, 1960, and to what we, where we are today, that's what a, a comrade DP spoke about, that in this country we need a revolt. And the reality of, of this thing is, is that wherever there's an injustice, there's always going to be pushback, there's always going to be people on the side organizing. And the African people might appear to have been defeated uh, uh, with their sell out project of, of 1994 today. And I mean, we saw with the uprising in Ismas for the uprisings in, uh, uh, in Marikanas, there is a growing resentment, there's a seed that is growing in, the, in this country of where revolution is going to come. And what really is important is that uh, the struggle must be correctly defined and continue to be what it was. And also as the members of the peace, we, we must understand that we inherited the struggle. And even if we are unable to do that, whatever organization that comes and where, wherever they come from, as long as they speak the real project of the 1959 national building project that we spoke about and the 1949 program of operation, uh, the struggle that Hinsa fought, the struggle that Makhanda fought, the struggle that Nyabela Gamapo fought, those are the struggles that we speak about. And if there comes such a time where uh, there's a movement that is speaking to that, we will not hesitate to even join them in the streets on the question of the Rehomus power land. Because currently, at the pace that we are going uh, on the question of land restitution, we're not even going to achieve it. But that might not be in our lifetime, but it does not mean that in our lifetime, when we're still alive, we must not do the little that we, that we must do of organizing because we are mere tools of history and we must allow ourselves to be, uh, to be those tools that propel our nation forward. Mr. Lynch. Thank you so much, Comrade Petani. Um, and thank you so much to everyone who joined us from home. Um, we hope that you will still be able to join us for the sessions on Saturday and Sunday. We look forward to your engagement and we do look forward to any thoughts that may have come out of this particular session. Do continue engaging, do continue sharing knowledge, and do continue just uh, conscientizing um, even fellow people wherever you are. Thank you so much. And that's it from us tonight. Thank you.